Hello, I'm Jamila Jamil and welcome to Why Way. So this next episode of In Their Shoes of Jamie Winders is such a refreshing conversation. Jamie is a writer, a cultural commentator and an Iway community member based in London and sits down with guests to reflect on obstacles, perseverance and spirit. It's a bit silly, it's irreverent and mostly it's just fun. I cannot wait for you all to enjoy it. So comment below and tell me what you think. B mark. B mark. Blink. <laughs> so much makeup Whoa. on my face. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. You are a stylist. You have mm. styled the likes of Adele, which we will not. I'm yeah. just throwing that out there. Yeah. Styling team. I don't want to take full credit for that one. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And then you've moved into documentaries, so you worked with the BBC on a documentary that has yeah. seen a million people seeing your face. Mm. How's that for you? In one word? Not realistic. Fine. Like, what does that mean? You know, True. Whatever. You don't know what they were doing, they might yeah. have been on their phone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That Netflix and chill thing where you're not looking. <laughs> you are my favourite combination of fashionable and fearless, so thank mm. you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. That's okay. We have a mutual link. <laughs> yeah, we do. And that link is looking stunning. Yeah. So I would like to start with how did you get into fashion? What was your route? I studied fashion. I actually wanted to be a primary school teacher. And I was like, nah, like I like them, but don't like them that much. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was like, I wanted, I always wanted to do fashion, but I didn't know in what realm or how to do it. But I went to uni, did fashion business in Glasgow. And then I went from Glasgow, I moved to New York and did mm. PR. And then I was like, I'm inherently a little bit too selfish for PR because it's quite a... Yeah. Giving. PR was my first internship. Yes. I also studied fashion business. Oh, Thank did you so you? much. Oh. Was, oh. God. And P I was the exact same. I was like, PR? No. No, not All for I me. care about is me yeah. right now, yeah. as you can tell. <laughs> so I was like, no. Yeah, same. And then I went from PR to fashion features for a little bit, didn't love writing. So then I went into styling and yeah, the rest is history. I still kind of style now. I don't completely not do it, but I just kind of do a lot more commercial work now. Yeah. I mean, I think that's often the way with the industry, like people get in it yeah. and they think this is the bee's knees yeah. and then they actually realise that you do just get the coffee yeah. and you do just end up in that fashion cupboard. Yeah, And the bee's knees don't pay. They don't pay. No, Not those, enough. Those knees don't pay. <laughs> <laughs> we need to up the fee on those knees. Right, think. right. But looking at your childhood, yeah. what was fashion, how did fashion play a role there? Because you migrated to mm. Northern Ireland when you were really young. Yeah. What was kind of your experience? of being a black person in Northern Ireland yeah. and your fashion. The thing is, fashion didn't come for me from Northern Ireland. It came like, I'm Sudanese by birth and my, both my parents are Sudanese and I'm very entrenched in that culture and like just everything that comes with it in terms of the beauty of it and the richness of it and just the gold and the materials and sequins and everything else. So it was always a huge part of my life. So I think that's why I've always kind of been into it. It was always my mum's little rag dolls we used to call. My brother used to be like, you're just her little like dress up doll. She likes to dress you up. And then, She's done a good job. I mean, yeah, you're still, right, you're still doing all right. <laughs> just, just a bit. Just a bit. <laughs> From there, I kind of was like, Northern Ireland didn't, I guess, have that much of a say in my fashion sense, in a sense. I think mm. it was still very much the Sudanese part of me. But then obviously moving to London and then traveling the world, you sort of are like, actually, fashion yeah. can mean loads of things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I definitely think it started with my culture. I sure. think you have spoken a lot about, and I know I kind of have lots of brain waves on this, mm. Um, mm. about the crossover of fashion and politics. Mm. What <laughs> does that mean to you? Because I always say that my style is political yeah. in essence. Yeah. Would you would you say the same? My thing about fashion is I always say that fashion is your representation to the world before you've opened your mouth. There's so many people that we look at them and we don't I've never heard their voices. I don't actually know what they stand for, but I can sort of get an impression of who they are by the way they dress on mm -hmm. average. Mm -hmm. So I always think even from that, socially and politically, I can kind of get a vibe for the person. I think you can say a lot. You you do. Like, I think you can say a lot by who you are. Maybe too much. <laughs> no, never. No, it's never too much. That's the thing. If you'd not ever met me and you were having that... Yeah. ..that process of you can tell, like, what would you what would you think? Eccentric. Rude. But fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right, though, because it's like stereotyping... Yeah. ..in a way, because yeah. it's something that... Oh, it completely is. ..you're aware of, or, mm -hmm. you, or you know it's bad, but you do anyway. We mm. all do it, mm -hmm. like... Mm -hmm. Stereotyping you as an iconic and people woman. Use it, and the confidence thing as well, right? That's mm. the thing with fashion. It, it gives you a persona that you kind of want to or do embody. And there's something really important about that for me. I think clothes are a huge part of identity. I think people are just like, oh, fashion, whatever. It doesn't mm. really matter. But actually, 
it's a huge part of who we are. We all have to get dressed every morning. So we make a decision yeah. about who we're going to be. So yeah, definitely. I think it's a lot more political than people think. For me, there was a period of time where I just wear eccentric clothes for the mm. sake of it. And then I kind of really realised the the nuance of it, especially mm. as existing as marginalised voices. You're like, yeah. actually, my existence here, how I look, is a moment and it's a political Yeah, standpoint. I think for sure. Like, I think working in the industry as well, I was so... I was never the rich girl. I was never the girl who got to, like, get, have really nice things and have the Prada shoes and have the Celine bag. So I think I always felt like fashion, it, it was such an important thing that I needed to sort of prove that I was part of a world because it is a certain world that you want to be part of and you want to represent yourself in this world. So I'd always just like try and absorb everyone around me to be like, how can I emulate these people? Yeah. And I think only recently when social media came about, whereas everyone was given their own sort of identity. But back before Instagram, it was like, you need to look like everyone else if you want to fit in. Well, exactly, yeah. So now it's a bit different, and I am sort of finding it, finding my feet with it, and it is beautiful to do, but it's almost nerve-wracking when you knew your life before social media. Yeah. To now feeling like you have to represent on social media. Do you do it for you? Do you do it for social media? I mean, I do everything for me. Do you? Do you? And everything for social media. So <laughs> I have no balance there. So speaking of social media, we've yeah. obviously, over the past few months, mm. have experienced a wave of social movement, social uprisings. What has those past few months been like for you? <sighs> Emotional. Yeah. Like, I would be lying if I didn't say that I... When that movement happened and when that Blackout Tuesday happened, that mm. little hashtag, me and my girlfriends bawled our eyes out for, like, two weeks straight. I, like, didn't stop crying. And almost when you're reliving trauma that you didn't know you had, mm -hmm lived trauma is so difficult because you're like what are all these feelings that I haven't really dealt with and I haven't really approached or I haven't really confronted but once you get out of the tears and you get out of yourself and you move a little bit you need to sort of reflect and say that maybe this had to happen to get us to a new place mm -hmm. yeah because I think now people are forced to listen and before they were kind of listening one ear in one ear out and mm -hmm. I think now it's like well I can call you out on it and I think that's kind of what it's done to people mm -hmm. so it's given me a position where I can be like when I put it on my Instagram or whatever I was so scared but weirdly I had all these people being like wow like I didn't know and I'm like it's bullshit that you didn't know like exactly. it's so annoying that you didn't know mm -hmm. maybe that's is it my fault that I just like kept my mouth shut is it their fault for not recognizing it it's twofold it is emotional labor mm -hmm. it is you had those moments of just being like this is that mm -hmm. trauma that's mm -hmm. coming back up yeah and having to relive that and then often be asked to comment us to appear. A lot of people say that you shouldn't educate people and it's not your problem. There's loads of books and loads of movies or whatever. I think because I came from such a small town where there was a, me and my two brothers, my mum and dad were the only black people in the entire town. Mm. I've grown up in a world where we've been told to educate and had to educate. It's ingrained in me that I have, like it's just part of who I am. It's yeah. part of my identity. But mm -hmm. also, weirdly, when everything happened and things slowed down, like maybe like a month later, I felt like a loss of my identity. Because mm. a huge part of my identity is fighting that fight standing up for those rights so when you can openly talk about it what does that do for a part of me that was so important which was right. fighting that so it's figuring out what that means to me personally you know and then taking that to people mm -hmm. yes so moving on from something that is obviously a lot of weight on you mm -hmm. do you find because you're obviously a director we've worked together through that and you do a lot of social work through that but you also i think it's a chance for you to have fun. Yeah. Do you find that that is often your chance to just let loose? Do you know what? Directing's Crazy. funny. Yeah. Because I only really recently became a director. It was never in my sphere of something to do. But the thing about directing is it just gives you... You're creating narratives. And people are looking at you and wanting you to, to show them a narrative that they think they want. Mm. And that's part of storytelling. And everything I do is, is storytelling. And everything I do is quite emotional and quite, like empathy led and whatever else. Being able to tell stories in whatever way you can tell them is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And spending and directing the same as making documentaries, I just like finding out about people. So like even with meeting you for the first time, I was like, this is fascinating. <laughs> I want to know more. Who, <laughs> what am I looking at? Yeah. <laughs> Stop. Right. <laughs> tell me everything. No, yeah. It's true. It comes from that place of like, I guess like inquisitive. You're like, yeah. You have to be fascinated. You have to want to know more. Like when we were chatting, I was like, I just want to know more. Like, tell me more. Mm -hmm. I think that's 101 of being a director. Go. Okay. Favorite Netflix show of lockdown? 
the fall. Oh god, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. What celeb do you want to be for the day and why? Um, Will Smith. He looks like he's having fun. Four hundred times one hundred thirty-four. What? You heard me. Say 400, again. Four hundred <laughs> times one hundred thirty-four. <laughs> um, mm. four hundred thousand and something something. Sounds right. I don't even have the answer. Thank you. Amazing. What are you doing tonight? I've got to go do more work. You need to let me leave. Best hinge date, and it's not this. Uh, we we looked at the sunset on the bridge, Tower Bridge. Worst hinge date. This. This. <laughs> Am I wearing too much makeup? Never. Good. How good do I look on a scale of 1 to 10? 10! Thank you very much. I think often for us, and especially for kind of our generation, mm. it can feel like j jobs like that, like being a director, yeah. can seem so kind of unreachable. What advice would you give to people that are like, I'd always love to do this, but I'm just going to put it on the back burner? I'm a small town girl from Northern Ireland. I didn't know anyone. I didn't know anything. Mm. I literally, everything I have, I got by myself and networking and meeting people and chatting to people. Mm -hmm. But I think a huge part and the biggest advice I always give people is get to know yourself before you start telling stories about other people. I spent years, two or three years, just sitting back and being like, what do I like? What does it mean to be a black woman? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be in London? Like, I spent two or three years figuring that out first. So that I was like, okay, if I'm going to go forward and start finding out about other people, at least I know I'm stable on the ground of who I who I know I am for now. But also be open. Be open to yeah. not just opportunities, just be open to listening. Mm -hmm. A huge part of storytelling, directing, even fashion, even documentary making is listening. Yeah. Be fascinated in people. If you're not, you can't tell the story. Often we can get so worked up in trying to do interviews or do mm -hmm. documentaries. Mm -hmm as type of like a career thing yeah. rather than actually just sitting down and being like, I'm learning a lot from yeah. this person. Yeah. They're brilliant. Exactly. And watch stuff. Like I watch so many documentaries and I'm like, oh, I like that scene. Oh, I like that shot. I like mm. how they did this. And I like The only reason I've been able to become a director and come behind camera is because I spent a lot of time visibly on set watching people, watching how they move, watching how they interview. Mm. Like I'm just watching you. Right. <laughs> I, you need to know all the realms of everything. You can't just be like, I'm just going to do this one thing and it's over. Yeah. I've only started directing literally in the last, like, Christ. six months. Bravo. Thanks. You're one of those people that's like, <laughs> yeah, in lockdown, I actually yeah, became I'm one of those. a director. <laughs> yeah. No, but I also made the banana bread that everyone made. And, Thank God. Um, yeah, I did that. 